we are live. Welcome, everyone, to today's reading of the psychology of totalitarianism by Michael Desmond. I am joined by my co-host, Alex Maselli, and we are reading Chapter 9. Alex, do we have any Ten. opening thoughts? <laughs> We're reading Chapter 10. <laughs> Excuse me, Chapter 10. I was actually livid reading this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goody. I get to hear you right <laughs> Okay, so while I agree with him that totalitarianism is bad, sometimes I disagree with the logic he uses to get to his point. He says that at two, two things. One, he says that psychology and psychiatry today is uh, dominated by the me mechani uh, uh, how do I say that word? mechanistic, mechanistic view uh, ideology and um, looking to the brain to figure out behavior. And it's like, that is literally the opposite of what is true within the industry of psychology and psychiatry. They will ignore the morphology and possible damage or like pathology of formation of the brain for understanding psychology and behavior basically until a person is having seizures and that are like oh it's a grand mal seizure like that's one of my biggest complaints about that entire industry so i'm like what are what planet are you on that you think this is true i'm like what the fuck that was so left field and i was like that is retarded why does he think this and secondly the the actual problem of logic wherein he says because we don't understand currently all the things about the brain that lends itself to these behaviors or these phenomenon means that it's clearly something beyond the brain i'm like that's not uh, i mean like you're it's possible i i'm not going to discount the possibility but you can't discount the possibility that it is the actual brain just because we haven't discovered how it is the brain that you haven't eliminated that as a possibility just because you haven't figured out how it ties to it. I I'm, I was like, what kind of leap in logic is that? That, oh, we haven't figured out how uh, extreme bouts of anger could be caused by a, something in the brain. So that means that it's a problem of personality. He believes in the ghost in the, in the machine. And I don't. Like, I really don't. And you can't, he believes, he says at one point that because someone's brain was mostly uh, like non-functioning but then they still had like a functioning consciousness that was like with a five percent of their physical meat brain still available to uh, only available to them that consciousness dr is a force outside the brain that drives the brain and i was like what what <laughs> I, he's he, he makes these weird leaps about the brain that like just really did not follow for me and I'm like okay you can believe in the soul I'm not saying you can't believe in the soul you can have faith but don't try to argue it faith and it and belief they're non-cognitive uh reasoning it's not even reasoning I and you're not supposed you well, shouldn't try to apply logic to it I don't think it applies and religion are both are both fundamentally non-cognitive they're irrational you know Yes. You, you don't really choose, for example, to be conservative or not. No, exactly. So to me, this idea that he would try to make a like a, a logic formation to to get to the soul is is a non-starter. You don't even need to do that. I will accept the fact that you believe the soul exists without you trying to logic it into me. Like I I think that the logic there doesn't follow. I think it's something that you you believe based on faith that it's about a lack of evidence to get there. So I can't, I'm incapable of getting there because I do need that evidence. But I I just think it's really weird that he's, he's basically arguing for the soul from a logical standpoint. And I just don't believe that that works. So I think like the whole chapter was mostly illogical and at some points just flat out wrong about how the world works like the psychology thing 
I was like, where, 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 how does this help us understand totalitarianism in the first place? <laughs> That's my rant. <laughs> All right. Um, the one thing I would note is I do think that he is, he, he does make a leap in logic there. I will agree on that, but I think he does at least make, uh, he makes a plausible case that materialism might not be completely true. Uh, based on someone whose brain tissue is almost completely gone, but who functions normally, I I it don't makes it I plausible. It's not it. It doesn't confirm anything. No, it's not it proof. It, look, it makes it look like it might possibly be true. Yes, and I I can take that for true for like uh, as as a conclusion as well. What I can't take it as a conclusion is like that it's absolutely certain at that point i don't think you can be that certain <laughs> about that um so i i think that's where i have a problem with him and yeah I, I to me the idea that oh because we don't know how something works yet clearly that means it's mystic magic kind of conclusion is just weird to me it's like what we thought that about things like 200 years ago that we now have explanations for so i don't understand why you would make that argument Right. And I think that ultimately it's less interesting than maybe everyone makes it out to be. You know, everybody says like, oh, well, neuro what, what the neuroscience says will de define whether or not we believe in the soul. But I guess I don't buy it. Like, let's say that you can make someone hallucinate the color red by touching some neuron or some sensor in their brain. Okay. So what you've proven is that touching someone's body in a certain way can change something in their mind. But we've always known that. Like, as long as humans have existed, we've known that you can hit somebody over the head with a rock and knock them out. That changes their mind. If you hit them hard enough, it changes it into pudding. Uh, <laughs> so... Yeah, that's the thing is that to me, that's why I say you can, you can, you can believe in the soul and still take all the mysticism out of the brain. Like you don't have to have a sense of in in out of the human consciousness even you you can still believe in the soul and have that be something non-mystic i don't understand uh you know the brain as something non-mystic i don't understand his need to marry these two things there's plenty of scientists who believe in um uh the mechanistic quality of being human while still believing in the soul they're able to have because like i said it operates on a completely different type of cognition than like understanding the world around you so i i don't understand his need to do this right right because i mean there was a short conceit after the enlightenment oh caleb's on this train again uh <laughs> where where we decided that since everything seemed it seemed like mechanistic explanations were replacing everything we didn't need all the old superstitious philosophical stuff like the ideas of vitalism or consciousness or what have you but what you find is that when you chase all the scientific explanations down to the root even if everything is fully explained the old issues are all still there like th these these fundamental concerns don't evaporate just because you have a theory of chemistry or whatever it, they just they just retreat but they're still there at the root and they kind of have to be it's not so much a god of the gaps thing like you always explain whatever can't be explained it's more like you always have some way of framing your worldview and i i guess postmodernism tries to get around that by saying that there's there aren't any meta narratives but that's always an ironic gesture it's never totally sincere uh, that's, yeah. that's, all, that's always a wink and a nudge it's you never actually do that yeah, I I agree with that. <laughs> I I guess I I don't mostly understand the purpose of this chapter. Um and what it what we gain from from it because like maybe I would be okay with it if he wasn't just flat out wrong with how psychology and psychiatry as an industry works today. Because they don't have a mechanistic view. They are ghosts in the machine, even when they're secularists. There's actually only one doctor that I know of that pushes the mechanistic view of psychology and psychiatry, and he's Catholic. 
it's funny is the ghost in the machine is not a ghost in the individual human. They put it in society and act like that changes things. You know, yeah, the, 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 the magical that's pixie what's... dust is no longer consciousness; it's identity or social construction. And this is taken to have some mystical power to make things exist in a certain way. And, and not that things aren't socially constructed. Like for example, money is socially constructed, and and I would argue computation is socially constructed. A computer exists as a physical object, but to say that it computes is it it, it works as a computer if we agree it does. Um, so I, I would definitely say that some things are socially constructed, but, but but for example, we think that identity is magic. If you identify as a certain thing, some something spiritual changes, as if as, as if identity is the seat of essence or something. It's very weird, and and it's the result of taking a top down view, the same kind of view that someone like Deleuze would have taken, um, which is. Which is that, you know, reality is this big undifferentiated block of stuff, and as you slice it up conceptually, you get these unities. And the unities don't necessarily, they aren't composed of anything at the level below that level of analysis. You just, it slices down to the point where you individuate the things you want to see. That's where he gets the idea of, like, body without organs or what have you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, to return to the text... He, what he says is that, I kind of get it. In a way, it is beholden to, to the mechanistic worldview, but as like a th second or third order consequence. He, are, he does make the point that it's down to the brain, that they literally associate it with the brain. And that is not the dominant theory within psychology and psychiatry today. That is a fringe group of people that says that don't like most of psychology and psychiatry today while you said is is definitely mechanistic in the way that they view like social influence as the thing that is guiding you too much and stupidly um most of them are are essentially like mechanics who instead of actually looking under the hood just walk around the car and turn the car on and listen to it and don't ever crack the hood whereas very few of them think cracking the hood and i don't mean exploratory surgery by that i mean just like even just scanning the brain um like they just won't do it very few of them are willing to open the hood and it's like imagine being a mechanic and never opening the actual hood how successful are you going to be at one diagnosing the problems of the car and two actually solving them <laughs> and it's because like you said though that they're driven by theories that have nothing to do with looking underneath the hood they're all about you know oh you know this over you, you're uh repressed by you know social convention or whatever <laughs> Right. Or, you know, if, um, I've known people who have, it's, I'm trying to think of a good way to put this. It's, it's as if the, the, this is a third order or second order, a second or third order consequence of the mechanistic worldview in as much as if you accept that everything is mechanistic and meaningless, and efficient causality is the only kind of causality and all the other things that Desmond outlines. If you accept all that, then you're left with a situation in which it no longer makes sense to ask certain questions that we nevertheless really want to ask. Like, what's the meaning of life? What are we for? Uh, what is the essence of a human being? What's human nature? Those questions don't even make sense if you take the mechanistic worldview seriously. But it's, that's as like a fourth order consequence. Once the, you, you have to chase the mechanistic worldview all the way to its logical conclusion, and when you get there, everything starts to look meaningless. And a lot of people, including people who are self-described materialists, don't get this. Like, you can, you can argue, you, they'll say, what, I have a rich sense of meaning, and I'm a materialist. I'm like, well, you're not being consistent. 
It's like it's like saying it, it, it's like saying, oh well, I'm an anarchist, but I but I still think we should have a government. Yeah, you can say that. You can believe that you're an anarchist who thinks we should have a government, but that's still a contradiction in terms. By the way, if uh, anybody can click the like button, I would really, really, really appreciate it. It helps promote my videos and make sure that more people see them. I, I don't think that the that the world is that reality is actually that simple. Human often human beings are too simple. But it's sort of like the idea that I have that determinism is real, but it doesn't matter to you and me as human beings because we exist in a human context. I can accept that determinism is real, but I also reject its implications to how I'm supposed to behave. Uh, it, to me, that's the same thing with you can accept the idea that there is a cause and effect to everything in the world, including how we behave, but you're not at the level of knowledge and um i guess power for that to matter <laughs> so again it becomes like i think there's a possibility of having a duality of understanding because it's like i understand things that are bigger than myself that have that i can't control the problem is the idea of when people take these these big concepts like the mechanistic worldview and think that means they have control. That's where they fuck up. And I, so to me, I think you can believe in the mechanistic view of the universe of reality, but if you acknowledge the fact that, well, I'm not the mechanic, then, <laughs> then you can probably be fine. I think you'll be fine if you have that humility. The problem is, is those people who think, oh, we're going to figure out everything. And it's like, why do you think that? Why are you that arrogant? There is no way that you, the small little creature that you are in this vast universe, is going to get to that level. It's not like to me, that's where everyone screws up. It's like you can believe in these huge things. You just can't believe that they matter so much that you have control over them. Because you don't. Right. And, and a lot of determinists have this vaguely uh, sort of megalomaniacal bearing, or they smell like a megalomaniac and talk like one. I've noticed this about a lot of people who are professed determinists, especially the ones to whom it is extremely important. And that has always made me wonder, because determinism, if you took it seriously would seem to be a very humbling thing. Like, I have no control over anything. But no, the people who are determinists almost always are extremely... Uh, or, or, many of them are megalomaniacal or seem that way, have some of those traits, um, or domineering or obsessed with accruing power and status and money. Uh, and many of them are hyper-rational and extremely focused on trying to control things using their minds. I, I don't mean like, ooh, telekinesis. I mean like science yeah. and stuff. But yeah. Well... And they also, some of this, I think some people who already have a sense of a lack of control when they, in their personal lives, if they believe in determinism or the mechanistic worldview, they end up becoming nihilists, which just allows them to be pushed around by those ones who are megalomaniacs. Right. Right, right. And 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 the the and what I've noticed about these people is, it, determinism. They're very deeply invested in it. There are also people who have more of an abstract interest in determinism who say, "Yeah, it's true, but that doesn't mean we know everything." Uh, a, a professor I knew once, a guy named, uh, well, I won't say his name for his privacy's sake. I think he's still alive, <laughs> although it was pretty old when I talked to him. Uh, he mm -hmm. he once said to me. He brought up Moby Dick and the scene where Ahab is talking to Starbuck and saying, you and I have rehearsed this scene a billion years before this ocean rolled or something to that effect. Basically saying it was all predetermined this had to happen and we were, so to speak, rehearsing it already a billion years ago. And, he's, and what he said was, well, if I wrote Moby Dick, it wouldn't be as good or anywhere near as good, but I would have had Starbuck say, how the hell do you know that? Which is the point. There is a difference between determinism and fatalism. Fatalism is I know how this is going to go, and it has to go that way, and it can't go any other way, and I know that. And determinism is there is some certain way that 
is necessary and it will have to go that way, but I don't know what that is. And or or a determinist basic doesn't necessarily say that they don't know that, but they can say that they don't know that. So you can be a humble determinist and say, look, I think it that determin we can find out that determinism is true by reasoning, but we cannot necessarily find out what the predeterminations are. Yeah, we're not we're not to that level. That we just don't have that the amount of knowledge you would have to have to see the outcome of determinism, which was essentially being able to predict everything that's going to happen, is insane. There's no human being that is that level. Uh, the only the only thing that we have conceived of that even can do that are deities. And to think that you are on that level is insane. <laughs> and there are people who think that. You know, technology, I think, gives the illusion of control. Not just to elites, but to everyone. You know, I can open up my phone and swipe through Tinder and think, oh man, look at all these girls. I have such a huge pool to choose from, but that's an illusion. Uh, and I think with the elites, it's much the same way. It's like, it's like sort of like saying I can move down these little soldiers around on a map and I'm controlling the real world. Yes, if the soldiers in question follow your orders and if your plans work. And neither of those two things is guaranteed. And I think a lot of it, especially the... I think a good general principle here is that the more complex an interface is that you use to deal with some part of reality, the more powerful the interface can be, the more potential it has, but by the same token, the further it separates you from the reality you're trying to control. If the thing that I use to control my computer, let's say instead of a keyboard, I had some complicated assembly of wheels and pulleys and some rude Goldberg bullshit with bells and whistles and a hamster and a wheel and like an old lady or something. Um, I could get so absorbed in tweaking the interface and turning the knobs and pressing the buttons that I forget, or, or so to speak, not that I forget literally, but that the, re the thing I'm trying to control with this machine vanishes from view. I become more about the interface than the thing I'm trying to control. Uh, well, I've noticed that with, um, there's a mindset, I I actually have this mindset, so I try to stop myself when I do this, that the more customizations you have, the more ability to um, plan that you have, uh, there's the mindset of a person who really, really likes to plan things. Uh, it's in it's really enjoyable it gives you the dopamine hit in the same way that people do from like gambling or sex it's it's very enjoyable to plan things that's a specific type of person and what are you planning are you ever actually going to do what you're planning the person who pl who loves planning that much often doesn't complete their plans because they spend hours upon hours upon hours every day planning instead because they're getting the pleasure that they should be getting from doing the things they're supposed to be doing instead of planning. <laughs> exactly. It's another example of that is like my, my amplifier for my guitar. It's a modeling amp. It has a computer in it. You can connect it to your computer and it has a gazillion settings to make a tone sound exactly right. Now, can anybody else tell the fucking difference between my guitar when I've tweaked this particular knob? Probably not, but I have fun dicking with settings and I like that. <laughs> so, so I do it. Yeah. Um, it, it's more about getting to dick with the settings than how it actually makes a guitar sound after a certain point. And I have found... Because in addition to being a piece of equipment for a guitar, the amp is also a toy. In and of itself, it's a toy. And I think that the interface as toy, the interface as toy, is one of the things that separates us from reality. And to get back to where we were, where we began this, the reason that our that um sort of our ruling classes and technocrats and so on made say and do very irrational things is because they've become so, so taken with this toy interface that they use to control things, with this apparatus of control, that they're more interested in the... They, they've, they've mistaken the apparatus for the reality that it's supposed to let them interface with. It's Definitely. like if I... And, 
it, it, this is a whole long way of saying map is not territory, but the, but the additional part is the more complicated the map is, the more likely you are to mistake it for the territory. Yeah. We're, they, I understand the purpose of trying to get something artificial that represents something else to match it as closely as possible. The problem it, is when you confuse the two, the, the artificial for the real, and I am not a fan, though, of the reactionary uh, crowd for trying to completely disrupt our desire to create the artificial to represent the real. I think that they need to, like, in to my mind, it's not about get rid of the map. Like, no, maps are useful. Um, <laughs> you, they, you get lost without maps. Um, so I don't want to get rid of the technology, the, for, you know, the artificial, the representation. Instead, I would rather us enact an, a self-control as adults and acknowledgement of the fact that it is artificial. I don't want us to instead go destroy it. Like, I think that's a bad reaction. Just you say you magically are able to destroy the artificial, like whatever it is, like, uh, all computers have been destroyed in the world. You think that someone isn't gonna figure out sometime down the road how to make another computer? Like that's, we already did it. We're gonna do it again. You can't, you, it's the Pandora's box thing. You're not closing it. It's coming back. Like e even if you magically destroy all of it, it'll come back because we're human beings. We invented it once. We're gonna do it again <laughs> yeah yeah it, it, it's point and, and the only way out is through um it's sort of it's sort of like someone whose last name is an alcoholic beverage drinking wild turkey one on one straight out of the bottle <laughs> it's like it, it's like That's a total a really lack of self-awareness it goes amazing <laughs> in eggnog. That is a really good whiskey. Like, I, I like that. <laughs> I haven't gotten it in a long time. But I like Rare Breed the best, if I'm going to be honest. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very fond of Wild Turkey 101. And uh, for scotch, mm -hmm. I, I very much like the Lagavulin. That tastes like you're drinking a campfire. It's amazing. Um... I like Glen Morgy if I'm going to get scotch. So Almighty Alm has been typing for a while, and I have been yes. reading it, but I haven't been able to respond. Uh, thanks for showing up, Almighty Alm. Are you the Almighty Alm because of Alm, or is it like resistance? You know. <laughs> anyway, he says, Good day. We must be careful with generalization, especially with the psyche. Recently listened to a theory that our meaning crisis has led to our identity crisis. Gestalt should be the geist of psychology, in my opinion, a pattern leading to a complex. We are more than the sum of our parts, that is also what makes up the psyche. We are far more complicated than we can understand, even or especially ourselves. The system with the system idea. The, the whole is certainly more than the sum of its parts. I, I think that if you're going to... Like, on a very broad level, I, I, I guess what I want to say is that you can't determine behavior via muriology. Uh, co like, composition is not identity. Case in point, I can, I can, you can slice me into 50 pieces, and if you put them back together the wrong way, I'm not here anymore. Um, so, yeah, it, muriology is, uh, is not sufficient for determining the behavior of something, sure. Um, where were we? I, I'm going to get back to the text again. <laughs> This is quite a good stream. Um, and he goes through, this is one thing. He points out how the reductionist worldview basically works, and he makes a good point at it. And this, it's not, you, you probably can't read it because it would be backwards, but the point is, is you have physics down here up through chemistry, biology, and then all the way up to psychology, and it branches off. And this is a model that a lot of people hold to, whether they know it or not. Um, even a lot of people who say they don't care for philosophy have a, have a lot of philosophical commitments that they don't really examine. And the fact that they say they don't do philosophy 
means they don't have to examine their assumptions, which means they can stay trapped in them, which is a great way to be a smart, stupid person. Um, it's not recognizing one's ideology beforehand. And, uh, like, you, we all have something we believe in, uh, a way of viewing the world that drives how we think about everything. I'm aware of that. I'm clearly more on the, like, individualism kind of uh ideological branding but i the idea that oh no i'm i i don't have an ideology it's like yes you do <laughs> right right and it allow it and what that really amounts to is a refusal to examine your priors that's all that really is uh Sweet and utter lack of self-awareness Yes. Deliberately, yeah, though. I was yes, deliberate, willful lack of self awareness. But of course, self awareness brings questioning and and destroys confidence. And there is such a thing as being a little too self aware. But but at the same sure. time, some people really really need it. I'd say the majority of people are not at all self aware, um, like the majority. And uh, I think that some things that we're noticing now that the narcissism of um identity is uh a distraction from learning about yourself it's because it involves these like handy labels that don't require you to really think and then puts you in these specific social groups so that you can uh develop your tribalism really fast so it's like no, all of that is just to avoid some self-examination <laughs> right right and there's also a kind of megalomania that goes with it in as much as there is a conceit that that if you can classify something that means you control it like if if i can put a label on something that means i own it somehow and it in a very abstract sense you do in, in a way get power over things by giving them names the power to give something a name is like like you know in a lot of old mythology and stories knowing the demon's name gives you control of it. And that's pointing at, at sort of this truth that in order to think about something correctly, in order to get a grip on what it is, like I need to know what it is so I know what kills it, so to speak, it, it helps to give things names, sure. But people get to the point where they treat it like a talisman. Like, because I can stick you in this taxonomy that I invented, that means I know all the relevant facts about you and they're and those are the only relevant facts because they are the only things that are defined by this taxonomy i invented yeah yeah <laughs> and, and 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 i think that definitely you know, I, you said before, Alex, that you think technology is kind of a scapegoat, or maybe that I use it as one because I blame everything on technology. To an extent, yes. I don't say, I've never pointed at you to say that. I just consider that I hate it when I see it happening. <laughs> right. But I do think it made, it made me think, and I thought maybe I, it's also second order consequences of technology that are not inevitable that also cause problems. So, for example, one thing technology does that it is supposed to do is make us all wealthier. And yeah, yeah, there's still inequality, and there's still, I'm not denying that, but you you can't deny that with as technology has advanced, even the people at the very bottom are better off. When was the last time you saw a homeless person who was thin as a rail and starving to death? Because they're usually all fat. Now, granted, they're being slowly poisoned by industrially produced pr food and processed food, but nobody's starving to death. Um, because technology has made us so wealthy that it's pretty much impossible to starve. There's there's so much food floating around. You granted it might not be good for you, but you can eat it and stay alive. Yeah. Um, so so technology does make us wealthier. And I think that a lot of sort of the dysfunctions, the novel dysfunctions that we're seeing in the population now are things that used to that we've always had, but here's the catch. The kinds of things that everybody has a problem with now used to be problems that only rich people had. Like being really neurotic and anxious and not being able to talk to anybody. Well, or, there there have always been people who had that kind of problem, but most of them were like dukes and earls and barons and 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 rich people <laughs> because they had the money to afford being that screwed up. 
And now, with technology, now we're all so frickin' rich, we all have, like, rich people problems. Another thing well, I think and... is kink. Go ahead. Is kink. Oh. Like, why is everybody into, like, having weird sex now? That used to be, like, a degenerate rich person thing. Well, we're all rich now. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I would say that, um, uh, to some regard, the, the point of technology, and it's always been this way, is to to shorten the amount of human labor hours. That has always been the point of technology. Um, so, for example, the invention of the car and what used to take you hours to do now takes you minutes. You travel. Like, every, everything that you had to do essentially by the fruit of your own body is now being offloaded. So you So the point is then to create free time. That's what technology does. It creates free time. So the problem comes when you don't know what to do with all that free time. If you are not smart enough to figure out how to occupy yourself, then technology becomes this thing that enables essentially one of the easiest ways to spend your time, getting dopamine. And if you're not smart enough to figure that out, you will be trapped in that. And there are social things that you could do that will prevent you from doing those things. Um, for example, a, a very good old way of preventing you from falling into a dopamine problem is religion. Religion was a really good block on um, wasteful behavior, wasteful time of idle even Christianity has the the saying idle hands or the devil's play things um, because and like the problem is those that people are less religious than they used to be and they haven't replaced it with something else that is as useful as solving this problem as religion used to be. So I, I, that's why there's a lot of religious people who are not dopamine addicted, who are capable of handling their free time well, whereas the secular world is having a lot hard, harder time with this. Now, um, that doesn't mean it is impossible to do this without religion. It definitely is, You, but it does take a certain level of intelligence to get over it. And a lot of people are too lazy to, to actually use intelligence to get themselves out of problems. They would much rather someone else tell them how to do it. And it's it's also very self-destructive to say it's not a problem it's not a problem that i'm addicted to these quick easy dopamine fixes we should just normalize this instead and then i get to be not happy but at least pleasured <laughs> all the time and that's a that's one of the biggest issues of our society today okay I understand. Um, so, so you're saying basically is that it's so easy to get dopamine now that it's very easy to get addicted to things, and there's all kinds of new addictions. And, and I think it's true. A friend of mine, by the way, everybody, when Alex talks about religion, she is an atheist. So don't think that she's trying to convert you because she's really not. I'm not. <laughs> I just acknowledge history. <laughs> Well, I remember I had a debate with someone whom I'm not going to name because I th I think they're a really nice person and they've done a lot of good for me. But they they ha this person has a sore spot. I'm using they not to give away their gender. Uh, where they are, they at one point were kind of a cringy new atheist and they still hang on to that. And they cannot even admit the institutional benefits that have come from religion historically, quite separately from whether it's true. And, and I actually argued with them at one point and finally just asked, okay, because they were saying, oh, well, the benefits to society came from science, not religion. Nobody prayed to make this happen, and science did. And I said, okay, well, which institutions made it possible for this kind of investigation to happen, such as, you know, Grender Megal, Grender, Gregor Mendel and his peas, <laughs> or, or like all of, the, all of the academic stuff that happened during the Middle Ages and Renaissance. And the per my interlocutor just said, this is why I can't argue with anyone about this, because they do what you're doing. Bring up history? <laughs> like all, Acknowledging the reality of the, the past? The, well, the only thing that really... Well, the, the, the actual question, that was the way it went, like, the gist of it, but my 
exact words or close to my exact words were, so are you talking about religion as an institution or as a set of beliefs? And that's when they just snapped. Because as soon as they admit that that distinction is there, suddenly they, they have to admit a bunch of other things they don't want to admit. So they just, like, short circuit. And this is an extremely rational, a very rational, very careful, analytical person who is normally very detached, but for some reason just cannot deal with this particular point. I always, I do think it's weird that I'm usually on the side of saying that religion has its use, uses, because I, I, I don't... I, I'm like I said, I have no compunction to go to church at all. I don't believe in the soul. I, I, there's not a single religion out there that I believe that I have faith in. But I'm not going to pretend as though it doesn't have its social and historical positive impact. Like the and United think... States would not exist without Christianity in Europe. That doesn't we we don't exist without it. And I don't think that acknowledging that makes me a traitor to atheism. <laughs> right. Right. And, and, and what's interesting, I think, is that the, the, this is that there's a, there's a long tradition in Western culture of self-criticism, going all the way back to Greek philosophy, right? You have to criticize whatever the dominant paradigm is. And I think that a lot of the negative stuff about religion in general and Christianity in particular comes from that tendency to being self-critical. Like, we're in the West. Historically, our religion has been Christianity, so we have to criticize it because we have to be self-critical. And it's interesting because you only ever hear about the negative stuff. Like, I remember growing up, all of my friends when we were teenagers, we were constantly talking about, you know, the atrocities of the church and wars of religion, witch burnings, atrocities by the Jesuits in the New World and burning people at the stake and blah, 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 blah. And then one day, one of my friends, when he went to college, he finally came to me and he had this sort of stunned look on his face. And he'd been studying these things and, and he, he finally said, I, I, I kind of realized the church basically rebuilt Europe after the fall of Rome. And I said, well, yeah, no shit. You never hear about that part. Like, I don't know. I'm, I know that I'm a, I'm someone who really, really loves history. So I might be an outlier here, but I don't understand all the things that people don't know about religion. Like, I am very confused by that. And it's, I know that it has to do with the fact that I'm just probably well-read and not tribalistic in how I react to information. <laughs> because it doesn't, it doesn't bother me that religion, especially Christianity, has all these positives to it. And maybe the, at this point, because Christianity is on the outs, it's more the western uh culture to start defending it because it's not dominant anymore <laughs> yeah no that's that's the funny thing actually is i is i have noticed this is now that now that christianity is no longer as socially dominant as it once was it's suddenly fashionable to defend christianity which is hilarious but it's how western culture is supposed to work it's very ironic and self-critical and it's a good thing yeah, it keeps us from having a theocracy. It also keeps you from, say, losing your job because you had the wrong religion. Which I, uh, and that's something that I'd argue with atheists sometimes about, the idea that um, the First Amendment allows people to have their religion um, and make their decisions based on religion. I don't understand this this idea that so many seculars have about the First Amendment that makes them think that Christians are not allowed to use their beliefs to guide how they vote. I don't understand the logic of that. It, I feel like that is, like, why would you think that wouldn't guide how they vote? Your non-belief guides how you vote. So why, why would the inverse not also be true? These are deeply held beliefs we all have 
they're gonna and voting or you know policy whatever you want to call it um no matter how we get there what we support politically is going to be guided by our deeply held beliefs so it made sense to me that christians would have that guide them so but there's this weird idea that that means that the first amendment that the separation of church and state means that oh no 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 christians are not not allowed to think about what god would want them to do when they go into the voting booth like what that doesn't make any sense what is that sound <laughs> oh that's me pulling the cork out of this i wasn't farting oh okay no that <laughs> Is there is that is she making some weird noise? Oh my cat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there is a so funny weird. story about that. Um one proof that I am not a smart person at all, that I am basically functionally retarded, is I was once in a in a conference call with my boss at the time. And I muted the microphone. Now little did I know that my external mic was not hooked up to Google Meets, it was my laptop mic. But my external oh, no. mic was on, so I turned it off, and then I proceeded to rip ass really loud. Oh, God. And my boss is looking away from the camera and just goes, <laughs> like, like he had just had this look on his face, like, good grief, dude. <laughs> if I, if I, I, and then I almost went further and shat myself because I was like, crap, he oh, heard that. Oh, God. Jesus. <laughs> oh, my God. You need to get a handle on that. And I don't mean your ass. I mean the microphone thing. Because you're constantly like, which microphone is it using? <laughs> well, why don't you come here and be my secretary, Alex? Uh, no. I'm good. <laughs> oh, come on. You, you, you can follow me around with, like, a clipboard and, uh, and make snarky comments about people and, and you know. <laughs> and I can smoke a cigar with my feet up on the desk, you know? No, I'm, uh, I have too much to do already. <laughs> See, this broad is one who'll be taking care of while I'm gone. No, uh, I, I don't even know what accent that's supposed to be. I don't think that exists anywhere. I think I'm just stupid. The Atlantic uh, accent that, um, they used to use in Hollywood. <laughs> yes, there we go. Beverly does a really good Atlantic accent. <laughs> oh, I'd love to hear it sometime. Uh, well, anyways, um, to return to the text, he 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 goes to quantum mechanics, and I mean, this is always a minefield because I, I don't I'm not sure what to think. I don't have the math right now to understand quantum mechanics, although it's a bucket list thing to to learn enough math to see it. And it, it kind I'm kind of conflicted because on the one hand, you have all these flaky people making these pseudo-mystical statements based in quantum mechanics, right? And then you have physicists saying, oh, no, 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 that's not true. That's, that's all nonsense. You don't understand it. You don't, you don't have the math. You don't really understand quantum mechanics. You're just, you know, farting out of your mouth. <laughs> but then, you, like, there's this book called The Tao of Physics, which claims that the metaphysics of various Eastern schools of thought is confirmed by quantum mechanics. And no less a physicist than Werner Heisenberg himself thought that everything in this book was true. Fucking Heisenberg. The Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. That Heisenberg. He agreed with yeah. this. So, I, I, so then I look at all these physicists saying, oh, no, 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 no. It, everything is still mechanistic and deterministic. I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> like, is it, is it because the people making these deductions don't understand physics well enough? Were it because physicists don't want to think through the broader implications of their work? Or some Probably. physicists. There's some who do. Yeah. Um, now, that being said, I know some fairly serious people, one of whom was a, the, he was, he was a former philosophy professor, who actually did have the math to understand all this. And he said to me that he thought that quantum mechanics actually does disprove determinism. That no matter how much information you have, it is just not... Even if you had all the information, you could not predict everything. And I guess, I, what I'm guessing you would say, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that you would say, well, I'm still a determinist, but it's probabilistic. 
And that is, fair enough, a kind of determinism. It's like saying the, this, the way this, this dice, these dice fall is random, but the way they fall does determine the next thing that happens. Yes, I would say that's true. But that doesn't mean I'm, I have all the information needed to predict how they are going to fall. That's... Well, I mean, like, the point is, is that you can, you actually can't predict how they're going to fall. Yeah, there's no way like, for that, for me they, to do They that. are actually, <laughs> they, they, they are truly 100%, re it's real randomness, real not indeterminism. But then the way that they do fall determines the next event. So it, it's a machine, but it's a machine with randomness, basically. Which, Which is and by the way, we haven't, as a species, been able to actually create a real random pattern. Like, we're not yet capable of doing that. And I, and, and a part of me wonders if the reason why we're not really capable of that is that our brains are hardwired specifically to determine patterns. And the reason why we're supposed to be able to determine patterns and why our brains are, like, really good at it is because being able to determine patterns is a really handy way of being able to hunt and get food and survive and so to me i would say that's an evolutionary psychology problem that we're not going to get past that's a limitation of how our brains work as predators we're never going to go beyond that that's why we are the smartest animals on the planet is because our pattern recognition is so damn good but we fall for thinking that recognizing patterns means that we can predict everything and it's like ah, that's not true we're still limited <laughs> yes right 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 and you know, there's there's no real randomness in a computer. The way I think the way that random production of random integers works in computer programming is it you look at the computer clock, which measures time down to I think like nanoseconds or microseconds. Uh, let me see here. Com so computer clock's smallest time unit nanoseconds. Computer computers the, the clock in your computer measures time in nanoseconds. So what it does is it looks at I think like the time in nanoseconds and uses that as C to generate something random, which is changing so fast that it it's essentially random for humans. Like if you tried to clap your hands at exactly the same time to even to a, or even set a metronome, it would still look totally random at the scale of nanoseconds because there would be deviations. The more the closer you zoom in on something, the more jittery it gets, basically. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. We don't have true randomness. And I, I don't know, like the question of what randomness is exactly is weird and philosophically problematic. It's very thorny. And, and people, you know, ideas about this range all the way from nothing is actually random to everything is random to randomness is an incoherent concept to, you know, on and on and on. Well, I think it, it's a really stupid movie, but K, the movie K-Pax actually brought up a really good reason about why randomness might be um, bunk, uh, is the idea, they, they ask the question, it's almost like an Eastern cone, why is a soap bubble round? Because this is the most structurally sound form it can take. There is a naturalness to things because of the fact that there are rules to physics and to chemistry and we don't understand all of them obviously our, our understanding is limited but for the most part things work the way they work because that's the most sound way in which they could work other things would just fall apart they would dissolve so the, you know, the soap bubble would pop if it was a square. So the idea is that um, for the most part, the world works in an orderly fashion. We just don't, we're just not going to be able to suss all of it out. And you know what? Honestly, I don't even think human beings are going to be capable of doing that in like ever. I don't, I don't think we are capable of that. <laughs> right, right.
Right. No, definitely. So, I mean, I don't think we were hoping in prior streams, like maybe Desmet's going to give us some pointers on how to uh, uh, tell the, uh, the uh, w World Economic Forum to go fuck itself and uh, redacted Klaus Schwab. But it doesn't look like he's going to do that. Nope. Um, so I think, I do think that he makes enough observations in this that at the end, maybe for our retrospective at the end of this book, we could have a stream where, like, maybe we uh, spitball some ideas on how that could be done based on what we've read here. Definitely. And actually, I, I would say one of the biggest things is finding meaning in life. <laughs> uh that that's i think one of the biggest problems right now <laughs> definitely you know and i think that one thing one thing that that needs to happen is we have to learn to treat as natural the idea that life has meaning and i have a little spiel about that for my closing remark because we're almost done okay <laughs> One thing that I notice that's kind of interesting is the idea that things are meaningful seems so foreign to the modern mindset that that they have to come up with some weird explanation for it. Like, for example, let's you know that uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson both died on the 4th of July of the same year. On the 4th of July. You couldn't write that in a script and sell it, right? And and it's true and it's true this happens all the time, you know, uh uh, what's his name? Salman Rushdie, in the Satanic Verses, has this this term he uses: the corny timing of real life. <laughs> the corny timing of real life. It's pretty funny, but what what comes to mind is that some people you can say it's a coincidence, which is fine. But some people say things like, "Oh, uh, this is proof we live in a simulation," for example, or "Oh, this is proof that uh, you know, that maybe that was fabricated." So let me advance something to you. A person from before the Enlightenment, like a medieval person, would have said, well, of course they did. That makes perfect sense. They would die on the 4th of July because that was an important date. That's how it had to pan out. Without even invoking God, just saying, yeah, the universe is intrinsically meaningful. Life is intrinsically meaningful. So it makes sense that that would, happened. That that would have happened. But modern people feel the need to say there's no way it could actually be meaningful, so there has to be some way to explain why this didn't really happen. Or some, some like, artificial thing that made it work that way. The idea that life could just be intrinsically meaningful doesn't occur to modern people. They almost, they can't grasp the idea, which would have seemed totally natural to people from before the Enlightenment. And in either case, I think it's, I think it's a fact that in both cases it's unconscious. Modern people are not aware of their assumption that life has to be meaningless any more than, than pre-modern people were aware of their assumption that it's meaningful. And this is something that the greatest contemporary philosophers like John McDowell are, are grappling with, like how do you re-enchant things in a safe way? So uh, I will leave us all with that. Thank you everyone for showing up. It's been great to have you along. We had a pretty good viewership this time, and I would